When Hitler triumphed in the summer of 1940, acclaimed by the Germans, his people take him for an infallible genius, endowed with extraordinary intelligence. Only, it is an image created from scratch. The Hitler myth that is sold to the Germans, it's the Fuhrer who knows everything, who works day and night, whose light in the office never goes out. This is the exact opposite of reality, Hitler is a dilettante, he never really works, he is someone who has never worked. I'm someone who can't stand long-term intellectual effort and long-winded and unable to read a file, more than 20 pages, Hitler does not work. In fact, Hitler likes to retreat to his refuge, like an artist hovering above reality. A handful of collaborators work in his place. His name is Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler, or Albert Speer. Hitler took over 15 years to recruit them. To say today that he is a good human resources manager, he surrounded himself very well by choosing as companions, people who brought him something extra each time. Who are these men in Hitler's shadow? What is each person's role? Around the Führer, there is an extensive network of collaborators. First of all, there is the close guard. The only ones who have direct access to him. Among his followers, an essential trio has been formed, whose first character is Hermann Goering. He is an ogre who thinks only of getting rich. Bulimic, opportunist, drug addict. He loves luxury and extravagance. The second, Joseph Goebbels, is a failed writer. His leg disability makes him complex. He avenges himself by a radical hatred. He lives only through his idol, Hitler. The third, Heinrich Himmler, is a petty bourgeois, cold, stubborn, meticulous. A smooth man who will become the assassin of the century by organizing what the Nazis call the final solution. The second circle is made up of younger and more ambitious men, who joined Hitler in the 1930s, when he comes to power and distributes the ministries. Among them, Albert Speer will rise to the top. In the guise of a distinguished architect, he is actually a great manipulator, who shares Hitler's megalomaniacal dreams, ready to do anything to become his favorite. Finally, at the bottom of the scale, there are the performers on the ground, Third Reich officials, who commit crimes and atrocities. Like Rudolf Huss, commandant of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, totally cold and contemptuous. This father, living with his wife and five children, in a house on the edge of the camp, organized the extermination of 1,100,000 people. At his side, Dr. Joseph Mengele, he is in charge of medical experiments. He embodies the cruelty of the Nazis. Without pity for his victims, this SS doctor carries out the worst mutilations in the camps, including on children. Without them, the worst crimes would not have been possible. To please Hitler, they compete. Around Hitler, they all hate each other. It's even a mode of operation of this small community there, encouraged moreover by Hitler, which arouses rivalries, competition and emulation. Hitler, still unknown, will recruit his accomplices in the early 1920s, in a troubled Germany. The vanquished of the First World War have only an army reduced to 100,000 men. So everywhere, former soldiers still constitute groups of mercenaries. The country is afraid of falling into civil war. In this procession, a small group from southern Germany has chosen as its symbol, the swastika. It is called the National Socialist German Workers' Party. NSDAP. 
Born in Munich, this small party attracts workers and the unemployed. In the front row of the spectators, Hitler, 30, small employee of the army, is not yet its chief. He is only its 55th member. This veteran of 14 to 18, known the fights on the front, to the rank of simple corporal. Since the defeat, he only thinks of avenging Germany. Hitler quickly established himself as the leader of the small party, by speaking in the beer halls of Munich. He denounces the humiliations inflicted on his country. But its resources are still very limited. Set up in this rear brasserie room. This is his first office. He writes his speeches on this modest corner of the table. To have more echo, it misses in Hitler, more prestigious representatives. In the fall of 1922, when a personality came to listen to him, he feels he has found an ideal candidate. Hitler was really full of joy, because he said, You see, there we have a wealthy person, a war hero. That is propaganda that we need. He's someone we absolutely must have, as a member of our party. The new recruit has a certain panache. Hermann Göring, 27, was a fighter pilot during the Great War. In combat in the sky, he shot down 21 aircraft. Hermann Göring was even decorated for his bravery of the cross for merit, the military's highest honor. They were practically the only heroes that German propaganda put forward. We made postcards and everyone in Germany had more or less knowledge of the exploits of this or that officer. And that's why Göring was someone who was very famous with decorations, he really is a character at that time. After war, as the German military aviation is disbanded, he is unemployed. But in Hitler's eyes, Göring presents another interest. He has connections in high places. Göring brought him his considerable prestige and social network. The flying ace married a wealthy woman. Karin von Falk comes from the Swedish nobility. They met in the family castle, close to Stockholm. The couple frequents the aristocracy and precisely, Hitler needs donors to finance his small movement. Upon joining the party, Göring is immediately propelled, at the head of the armed militia, called SA. Less than a year later, in Munich, the Nazi party wants to take power by a coup. During this November 1923 putsch, a shootout breaks out between the Nazis and the police. There are 16 dead. For the Nazis, it is a total failure. Hitler was locked up for eight months in the fortress prison of Landsberg. His party is dissolved. In cell, he writes main camp. In French, mon combat. Seriously wounded by bullet, Goering, he is on the run. He is inadmissible on German soil. He has to be operated on and he is treated with morphine to ease his pain. He becomes addicted to drugs. Goering takes refuge in Stockholm, in the country of his wife. Without profession, without future, he has bouts of violence. It gives him a mental breakdown and from the moment, where it also becomes a bit difficult to manage, it was his wife who, at that time, preferred to put him in an asylum to treat him. Goering made several stays in the psychiatric hospital around Stockholm. According to his confidential medical records, he was admitted for morphine poisoning. Goering is portrayed as suicidal, self-absorbed. He explains his mental disorders because he sees himself as politically dead. But the following year, it was reborn from its ashes. 
thanks to the presidential election of 1925, an amnesty has just been proclaimed, he is allowed to return to Germany. Without his Führer, Göring is nothing, he hopes to regain his place as leader in the party, but the current does not pass anymore with Hitler. Hitler at the beginning, wasn't so keen to see his ex-SA chief again, because now he has another SA leader. So Göring reminds Hitler, the services he rendered her. He said it, me, I lost everything, I was always your most faithful collaborator, so now it's up to you to show me a little bit of your appreciation. Hitler needs dedicated men and he finds a new place for them. Goering won't fight in the streets anymore, but he must conquer the worldly salons. He will struggle to regain his rank. He did not succeed until 1928, when he entered the Reichstag, the German parliament, elected among the first 12 Nazi deputies. In 1932, he even became president of this assembly. The second accomplice Hitler recruits, sees his career in Nazism take off at the age of 29. Hitler begins by entrusting Joseph Goebbels, a very delicate mission. He sends him to Berlin, the capital of Germany. With its 4 million inhabitants at the time, it was the largest metropolis in Europe. It is made up of huge suburbs, where the workers are crowded. It is nicknamed Red Berlin, because the communists have made it their stronghold. Hitler launches a huge challenge to this lame little man. Make the Nazis the first political force in Berlin. And the Führer knows he can ask Goebbels for anything. He is a man in desperate search of recognition, he is hungry for recognition. He finds it in Hitler, whom he considers to be a truly charismatic man, smart, superior, and towards whom he develops an almost romantic relationship. He finds himself in a real effective dependence, with regard to Hitler, from which he seeks recognition, friendly gestures, kind words. Goebbels says everything to Hitler, because until they meet, his life has been a series of failures. Affected by a disease in early childhood, Goebbels is disabled in the leg, he is ashamed of it. During the World War I, he dreamed of becoming a soldier. To explain his infirmity, he prefers to lie. He hides his handicap by hiding its origin, saying, I was wounded in the Great War, I am a hero of the Great War. However, he did not fight in the Great War, simply because he was not enrolled. Doctor of Literature from the University, unsuccessful writer, he has not found a job that matches his ambitions. Goebbels worked nine months as a small bank employee before resigning. Only Hitler gives meaning to his life. So he's no longer the little bank clerk, he is no longer the valiant little writer rejected by the big publishers. He is now the leader of the Nazi party, for an area that is still important, which is that of the capital of the Reich. Upon his arrival in Berlin, the new chief finds only a hundred active members and small offices. Everything is to be built. Goebbels begins by creating a journal, the En Riff, the attack in French. And to make the Nazis talk, he chooses a radical strategy. Stir up hatred. Less than a week after his arrival, Goebbels sends his big arms, challenge the communists in their neighborhood. Violent fights break out. Mass arrests take place. The police ban the Nazi party in the capital of the Reich. But no matter for Goebbels. The movement feeds on scandal. In this violent climate, Nazi propaganda finds itself a martyr. In 1930, a young activist, Horst Wessel, was stabbed to death by a communist. In the presence of Hitler and Goering, his funeral with great pomp provide an opportunity for an impressive show of force for the Nazis. And Goebbels keeps throwing oil on the fire.
Did he really deserve this death? That he had the courage to walk in the storm? This young German worker, upright and proud. To reward him, Hitler offers a promotion to Goebbels. He appoints him the party's propaganda chief. The third man in Hitler's bodyguard does not have the usual profile of workers and the unemployed who joined Nazism. Heinrich Himmler is a young bourgeois obsessed with the superiority of the Germanic race. At the party headquarters in Munich, in this propaganda film from 1929, Himmler is this young man with glasses. He still appears as a little junior secretary at the orders of his boss. The others do not perceive these ambitions. Himmler comes from a good family, Catholic, perfectly integrated into society. He is the son of a Greek Latin teacher, became headmaster of one of the best high schools in town. He lacks nothing, but very young, he adheres to the most radical racist group. Catherine Himmler is Ernst's granddaughter, Heinrich Himmler's younger brother. This political scientist studies the history of her family. The three Himmler brothers became virulent Nazis. Their ideology approached a feeling of superiority, the feeling that the German people were above the rest. This racist discourse also advocates a return to the land. Himmler becomes an agricultural engineer. With his wife Marga, he buys a small farm where they want to live in autarky to protect themselves from the outside world which they consider rotten. Alongside Hitler, Himmler is submissive. But he also has a real influence on him. In fact, we have since known that he defended his own convictions. He often obtained Hitler's agreement for ideas that he had himself. Himmler, the young bourgeois, believes in Nazi ideas, but he doesn't like to mingle with grassroots activists who constitute the heart of the party. In Himmler's eyes, these people are, one might say, debrained fools. It's the equivalent of a supporters club like Lazio or PSG in these good times. In reaction, Himmler therefore created a chic club within the party. These disciplined men in black will form an elite under his authority. The acronym of this unit in German consists of two letters, the SS. All must imperatively be of pure Germanic origin. They will be the most fanatical among the fanatics. When, that evening in 1933, Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany, once again, he does not want to work, as his role would require. He doesn't like being forced to work every day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. For him, it is unthinkable. When he began his career as Chancellor, from a few days, he immediately insisted that it was not his place to work. Once in power, the sharing of roles between his accomplices will have winners and losers. Goubales did not immediately become a minister. As for Goering, he triumphs. Hitler brought him into his first government in 1933. And no one is going to accumulate as many titles as him. In 12 years of power, just look at the variety of his uniforms. President of Prussia Grand Huntsman of the Reich Air Minister Marshal of the Empire A riot of decorations that triggers the jealousy of his great rival, Joseph Goebbels Goebbels at the start, is quite skeptical of Goering's role. He describes it very well as being an unbearable balloon, puffy, puffed up with fatuity, vanity, a vulgar pleasure seeker, a redneck in fact, 
a nouveau riche who wants tinsel, who struts around in ridiculous uniforms, decorated with medals and fodder. It's a puppet in his eyes. However, Goering is also a strong man. He installed the dictatorship in 1933. When the Reichstag catches fire under mysterious conditions, Goering, Speaker of the Assembly, attributes the fire to the Communists and is threatening. I will sweep with an iron broom all those who have obtained positions and privileges exclusively through their political affiliation, red or black. I will knock them down. A wave of repression descends on Germany. More than 3,000 opponents of Nazism were arrested without trial. Goering creates a new political police, the Gestapo. In 1933, the first concentration camp opened in Dachau. Opponents are subjected to forced labor. Goering earn points in Hitler's esteem. Goering has, each time the one when Hitler, looking for someone to entrust a difficult job, to one of his collaborators. But Joseph Goebbels also ends up receiving, a tailor-made position. A great ministry for propaganda. The frustrated writer now has the power to choose allowed books, and ban others. Books by Jewish writers or authors considered degenerate are burned in large public ceremonies. Like that evening in May 1933, near the University of Berlin. You do well to entrust the demons of the past to the flames. The German man of the future will not be just a bookman, but also a man of character. And for this we want to train you. He is also a fanatical anti-Semite. When the Nazis came to power, Jews represent only 0.8% of the population in Germany. But Goebbels imagines a way to persecute them. Trucks drive through the streets to spread a message. My dear compatriots, this morning at 10 a.m., we started the boycott of Jewish traders. Stores run by Jews are singled out, and the Nazis firmly dissuade customers from entering. Goebbels now wants to impose his messages on the airwaves. And so that the propaganda enters every home, he even had a cheap radio made on purpose. This climate he creates in Germany is particularly oppressive in the family of young Margot, five years old, who lives in Berlin. His father is a Jew, a bookseller, and sells banned books. I didn't understand everything. But I felt the atmosphere. We had received from Goebbels these people's radio stations and I always heard, the Jews are our misfortune. It was Hitler's voice and Goebbels' voice. And I had absolutely no idea what a Jew was. Joseph Goebbels monitors everything. Theater. Cinema. And he has the news viewed by an all-powerful censorship board. Goebbels also orchestrates a monumental staging of the regime. Behind the scenes, he takes care of the smallest details. Throughout the 1930s, in huge gatherings, filmed like a Hollywood blockbuster, Hitler is presented to the people as the Messiah. Joseph Goebbels' career is at its peak. But his tormented character will take over. 
Goebbels is completely at ease in crisis situations, in situations of distress, disasters. There, he is not at ease. He needs sound and fury. The storm for Goebbels will come from his private life. He married Magda in 1931, with as witness of marriage, Adolf Hitler. Their children are used over time by propaganda. The Goobales are the regime's model family. Dear Dad, do you see us walking towards you? You have already guessed that we are here to congratulate you. Because you are celebrating your birthday. The names of the six children all start with the letter H in homage to Hitler. Magda Goobales decorated by the regime, embody the ideal Nazi mother. And every year, a short sequence is staged to celebrate the father's birthday. Say, dear daddy. Quit say, dear daddy. Stronger. We congratulate you. Really? For your birthday? Because you're at work and you don't know what we're doing here. Joseph Goebbels cultivates this image of a good father. Like on Christmas Eve 1936, where he is filmed distributing gifts to the most modest little Germans. Thanks for the short note. You want that? Only, reality has nothing to do with this perfect image. Goebbels is known for multiplying adventures. He needs entertainment, he needs action, it needs events. How he loves cinema, how he knows it very well. As he has a great artistic culture, he participates. One of the ways to participate in the life of the cinema, it is to make castings and to say, Mademoiselle, come and have tea. He is known to be, I quote, his nickname in the film world, the Babelsberg Goat. Babelsberg is German Hollywood. It's on the studios, near Potsdam, the Babelsberg Goat. In 1936, Gubel strikes up romance with 22-year-old starlet Lita Barova. Hello! What? Today? It's a faux pas, who will have repercussions on the career of Goebbels. To put an end to this scandalous affair, his desperate wife Magda threatens to divorce. She confides in the couple's closest friend, Adolf Hitler. Hitler has no family. The German family is that of Joseph and Magda Goebbels. So when this family starts to fail, Hitler is not happy at all, requires him to break this bond there, and stop humiliating Magda Goebbels whom Hitler loves, as being a remarkable German woman, a mother. Hitler is so furious for this image, but also for Magda Goebbels, for which he has a lot of affection, let him turn away from Goebbels who suffers from it. In the network of Hitler's collaborators, a newcomer will take advantage of this disgrace and achieve an exceptional ascent. Albert Speer, however, starts from afar, among the men who joined Nazism late in life. In these images from 1935, we can already see their complicity. Hitler draws, beside him, in his impeccable suit, stands Albert Speer, 27, a young architect who hasn't built anything yet. In her youth, Hitler himself drew his sketches of pharaonic buildings. While dreaming of seeing them come out of the ground, the day he would come to power. Hitler and Speer have only known each other for a year but they share a common passion for architecture. Hitler saw through Speer practically the life he dreamed of. He always said he wanted to become an architect himself. And Speer adapted to Hitler's demands. Their project was always gigantic, megalomaniac. Hitler, Speer remarked, on May 1, 1933, at Berlin Airport, on Labor Day, which brings together more than a million people. 
a human tide. Hitler is fascinated by the festivities, which end with a spectacular fireworks display. Where his face crackles above the assembly. The organization is signed by Albert Speer. This great bourgeois who has just joined the Nazi party, and to whom Goebbels placed his first orders. And to whom Goebbels placed his first orders, it was Goebbels who introduced Speer to Hitler. But naturally, over time, a rivalry was born. Goebbels always found very important to be part of Hitler's entourage. And of course, in this case, Speer became a rival. Very quickly, Speer occupies a privileged place with Hitler. Unlike Goebbels, he is the permanent guest of his lair in the mountains. Both appreciate the same pompous style, which comes from antiquity. First of all, Speer is the architect, from the huge parade ground of Nuremberg, copied from a temple dedicated to Zeus. For party congresses, this esplanade can accommodate more than 340,000 people. Speer then built at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, the German pavilion, installed for the Paris exhibition in 1937. That same year, Hitler will give him the Order of the Century. Germania, the future capital of his empire. This disproportionate construction site was to last until 1950. It's about rebuilding Berlin. Along a 5 kilometers avenue, called Victory Avenue, Germania's buildings will be the largest ever designed. At the very end, this dome reserved for the Great People's Hall will be 16 times larger than that of St. Peter's Indiana Rome, which would still make it today the largest building in the world. For the people of Berlin, it will be an earthquake. 50,000 apartments were to be raised. Nearly 200,000 Berliners would have needed to be relocated. While there was already a great lack of housing. And to test the speed of its architect, Hitler will challenge him. Speer is to construct the first building in Germania in just one year. Eight thousand workers from all over Germany work at the same time, day and night. They build the future Reich Chancellery. To please Hitler, Albert Speer delivers the building two days before the fixed date. Hitler takes possession of his building, supposed to dazzle ambassadors around the world. Its chancellery is ostentatiously luxurious. With a marble hall, a huge study for Hitler and galleries twice as large as those of the Palace of Versailles. Albert Speer overtook all competitors in Hitler's esteem. The proximity of power fascinated him. You have to imagine that Speer was not even 30 years old, and he had already become one of Hitler's most influential advisors. Meanwhile, in Munich, one of Hitler's historical accomplices, Himmler, received no ministry. He's just been appointed chief of police in Bavaria. Ready for everything, he will carry out a bloody purge within the party, known as the Night of the Long Knives. It is one of the many steps he has taken towards power. Hitler then fears the power of another leader, Ernest Rome. Very popular, he leads the SA, a powerful Nazi militia recognizable by its brown shirts. While under his command, Himmler oversees the assassination of Rome and his entire staff. Even at the cost of blood, if a comrade stands in his way, he doesn't see any problem with his being eliminated, even if it represents a great danger. 
And Himmler emerged as the big winner from this bloodbath. His organization, the SS, the Black Order no longer has a rival. Himmler will be able to make it much more than a simple militia. For him, the SS is a real political project of which he managed to convince Hitler. Himmler worships the Germanic race. It refers to a dead king in the Middle Ages. He goes to meditate on his grave and he introduces Hitler, like its successor throughout history. King Henry I, transmitted, 1000 years ago, to our Führer Adolf Hitler. Human values, and the guiding role, for Germany. Himmler wants to build a new society, deeply racist, where the Germans of pure race, will be the only masters for centuries to come and for the blood of the superior race to reproduce on a large scale? Himmler founded special maternities where the SS could abandon the newborns who will be raised by the regime. It works a bit like the controlled reproduction of horses. You bring your fillies to the stables, there are stallions who are there, they impregnate your fillies and etc. To found the superior race, the Nazis also want to eliminate what they call worthless lives. From 1935, in all cinemas, these terrible propaganda films are shown. They show the disabled in a frightening light. The film insists above all on the expenses for society. What would these patients who spend their whole lives in hospital represent? This woman suffering from a hereditary disease would cost 153,000 mark per year to the community. His three siblings, 62,300 mark. These epileptics, more than 20,000 mark. To manipulate public opinion, an estimate of more than 1.2 billion marks would correspond to the financial cost of all hereditary diseases. The Nazis want to justify the crimes they prepare. But first we must separate and prevent these worthless lives from harming the people. Then, from 1939, began to be put in place real killing programs, especially the physically and mentally handicapped. Himmler never ceases to want to remodel everything. He also wants these SS men to have their own beliefs. I swear here. To Adolf Hitler, fidelity and bravery. Strange ceremonies take place in the chapels of Wolfsburg Castle, SS training center with this black sun as an occult symbol. Baptisms take place according to SS rites. Himmler himself performs marriages. The Nazis want to sweep away all religious beliefs that exist. If the Nazis had won, there would have been a new calendar, there would have been new feasts and new liturgies, a new baptism, new party that would not have been Christmas. This is also the Nazi utopia. It is such an important and global revolution that she had to change everything, including belief and including God. In secret, in the mid-1930s, Hitler is going to make a strategic decision, which he first shares with his right arm. Hitler himself set a program which, roughly, said Germany must be ready to go to war in four years. And to carry out this program, he creates a new administration, with a four-year plan leader, it's Hermann Göring. Overnight, in 1936, Hermann Göring was propelled to the head of German industry. Its financial envelope is unlimited. Its orders mobilize more than 228 factories, a unique firepower in the world at the time. The Germans, deprived of an army since the defeat of the First World War, prepare their revenge. My dear compatriots, 
My dear brothers in arms, what is the purpose of this four-year plan? I could sum it up in one essential sentence. The safeguard of German honor and the safeguard of German life. These new functions also allow Goering to grow rich. For these birthdays, for example, industrialists cover him with gifts. He receives collectibles, but he has a predilection for masterpieces and precious stones. The corrupt system they put in place is well organized. His office sent out little lists, like wedding lists, to the various company representatives, by telling them the marshal would like to have, this or that work of art or this or that object as a gift. Hermann Goering plays the Roman emperors. He likes eccentricities, like posing with a lion cub. Yes, my Caesar. Are you visiting me? Come. Are you satisfied, Caesar? Come on, pretty, jump. It's good. Hitler appoints Goering as his successor. Since Karin's death, his first wife died of cancer. The Germans lack a first lady. So his second marriage in Berlin is worthy of a crowned head. Thirty thousand soldiers line the route. Hitler, his witness, favored his grandiose nuptials to hide his own private life. Emma and Hermann Goering now embody the official couple of the regime. They increasingly represent Nazi power on important occasions. Like here, at a reception in honor of Mussolini. To entertain, Goering had his huge estate laid out at the gates of Berlin. Hundreds of works of art cover the walls of this palace. There were also a lot of hunting trophies. Dieter Wellershoff rubbing shoulders with Goering several times. Very young, he was enrolled in the Hitler Youth. And, at the age of 17, he was for some months a soldier on Goering's estate. When they were reviewing us, Goering always said, once I've passed you, you can relax. Which meant that we no longer had to stand up straight. You had to choose a path without puddles, and no mud for that big, heavy man to walk on. He was grotesque. If he occupies the foreground of the stage, Goering has a hard time containing Hitler. The Führer is now ready to start the war. Hitler regularly attends fight rehearsals. Despite his immense life-size exercises, Goering has great difficulty in curbing his impatience. Because he knows that the plan to prepare Germany for war got late. He explains at that moment to Hitler, you see, Germany is not ready yet. Yet, a year ahead of the plan he set himself, Hitler orders to go on the attack. He lives in a movie, he lives in a play. He himself is an actor in his own war. These are cards spread out on a gigantic table, flags that advance and pawns that he moves. For Hitler and his accomplices, entering the war in 1939 was disconcertingly easy. The German army seems invincible. After a single year of struggle, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, and France are invaded. Half of Europe is collapsing, and the division of the empire between Hitler's accomplices will be bloody.
Goebbels depends on one administration, Goering on another, and Himmler from another too. And we realize that in a policy of conquest, of colonization, predation, spoliation, there is an overlap of jurisdictions. And all this creates friction, tension. The great plunder begins. Goering makes Paris his hunting ground. He arrives in a convertible limo, roam the streets and go down to place Vendôme in a palace, the Ritz. Goering came to help himself in French museums, Matisse, Monet, Cezanne. He seizes hundreds of paintings to complete his gigantic collection. The same year, Hitler also landed in Paris. Albert Speer, its architect, is at its side. He promises to copy the most beautiful monuments of the French capital for their future Germania. Hitler was very impressed with Paris, the Champs-Élysées, the Arc de Triomphe. Of course he wanted to reproduce all this in Berlin, but in much larger dimensions. Back in Berlin, Marshal Goering triumphs in the front row. He directs military operations. And yet he hides the reality from Hitler. It is of course, from the point of view of the public, a dazzling success. From an economics point of view, it's a disaster. Because after a few weeks of fighting, Germany has no more bombs, more ammunition and very few planes. For fear of displeasing Hitler, Goering won't say anything. Boastful, on the contrary, he promises to crush England, in just three weeks. Himmler, he carved out an empire in Eastern Europe, where he oversees a vile policy of extermination, with total coldness. When Hitler visits him in Poland, its SS soldiers are already waging their great racist war. Himmler spends his time motivating his troops to justify systematic assassinations. What he always says to his SS men, it's that it's hard to bear, like a test. A painful task that they must carry out. But he says, we are morally strong enough. And he thinks that in sacrificial mode. He is saying, ah, I'm sacrificing my psyche so that my children can live. There is a whole discourse behind that. From 1939 in Poland, then from 1941 in the USSR, the Nazis experimented with policies of mass murder and deportation. Under Himmler's orders, they build their living space, a colonial empire populated by slaves and rid of its Jews. This project involves the death of tens of millions of people from starvation. We are in an imaginary world of letting die. At the same time, in Ukraine, but also in the Baltic countries, operate small mobile groups of SS killers, called Einsatzgruppen. These atrocities follow one another at a frantic pace. More than a million people will be exterminated by the shootings. In August 1941, Himmler traveled to Minsk, Belarus, to assess this killing strategy in person. He first inspects the Soviet prisoners, and personally witnessed these shooting executions. Himmler during a visit to Minsk in the summer of 1941, will witness the execution of 100 Jews. 100 Jews are executed, as an example, to show Himmler how it's done. and Himmler will faint before the spectacle. Himmler is one of the worst anti-Semites of the Third Reich, a convinced, enraged anti-Semite. It's not out of pity for the Jewish victims, it's just the show for the killer, it causes trauma. As unbearable as it may seem, Himmler, as the great leader of the SS, worries only about psychological trauma for his men. You have men who are not born killers, and so there are disputes not to make them accept before they start killing. Following the killings in Minsk, Himmler will ask his men, in Berlin, to find a method to spare the killers. In 1941, different methods of mass murder coexist. But at the end of the year, one order came from Hitler himself, will unify the procedures. 
he demands the extermination of all the Jews of Europe. Three years earlier, Hitler had warned, if the war became global, he would carry out his threat. Even today, I will be a prophet. If international Jewish finance, in Europe and outside Europe, had to succeed in precipitating the peoples into a world war, then the result would not be the Bolshevization of the world, so the victory of Jewry. On the contrary, it will be the annihilation of the Jewish race. And it is the entry into the War of the United States in December 1941, who finally motivates his decision. The final solution is decided by Hitler. At this moment, mass executions take place. In that year, there are almost 4 million Jews who were exterminated. For Himmler, it will not be possible to assassinate millions of people by mass shootings. And it is for this reason that the gassing will be seen as an efficient recourse to protect the killers. Gassing is not introduced to kill more people. On the other hand, the gas chambers have a major merit, it's to spare the killers. There is no more contact with the victims, you don't even see people dying anymore. We pick up the bodies at the end. Himmler then decides to concentrate on a single place, all these new extermination policies. A gigantic place that will become the largest of concentration camps and killing centers. A place to which they will be deported. 1,300,000 people. One, it has to be a place that is central to the Nazi empire. Two, it must be well connected to all parts of Europe. And three, that he has a killing line, which is extremely fast and efficient. The real railway and central node of the Nazi empire which is going to be chosen, it's Auschwitz. Himmler entrusts Auschwitz to a field official, one of the worst specialists in the camps. His name is Rudolf Oos. He becomes, at the age of 40, director of one of the largest projects of the Third Reich. These images of Auschwitz that we know, are those of the liberation of the camp in 1945 by Soviet soldiers. To direct this vast complex, the greatest camp of the Nazi empire, Heinrich Himmler, had the choice between several leaders, but he chose Rudolf Oss, a man with a murderous past. In 1923, Oss assassinated a man, a communist, who was held in prison for five years. When he will be out of jail, Himmler took him under his wing and eventually found him a new profession. In the early 1930s, Himmler went to see my grandfather and suggested he join the SS. Rainer Oss is the grandson of the commander of Auschwitz. His father, Hans, is the youngest son of Rudolf Oss. He first had a post at the Dachau camp. He stayed there for four years. Then he became head of detention, then deputy director of the Sexanghausen camp. And in 1940, thanks to Himmler, he was directly appointed commander of Auschwitz. When he arrived in the locality of Auschwitz in 1940, to set up camp, Bus only discovers a small town of 15,000 inhabitants as well as a former barracks of the Polish army, where he establishes the first place of confinement, Auschwitz I. And he also spots a villa next to the camp. Us take over this house, whose Polish owners are expropriated. On the second floor, from his office window, this bird's eye view of the crematorium, don't bother him. The commander settles in the villa, with his wife Edwidge and their five children. The family thinks only of his social ascent. These photos from the family album attest to this. Their new living environment provides unexpected comfort. 70M from the crematorium, the garden, surrounded by a large wall, becomes children's favorite playground. It was so big they could ride bikes inside. 
Today, it seems that at that time, my grandparents went from being anonymous to being VIPs. Thanks to the concentration camps, the O's lead a comfortable life, with a workforce reduced to slavery. There is an inmate who serves as a gardener, inmates who serve as servants inside the house, who took care of the children if necessary. There is everything to benefit in any case from a gentrification in Auschwitz. My grandfather wrote in his memoirs, it was heaven. Like all SS leaders, Buss is constantly motivated by Himmler, whose arguments have been recorded only once, for internal use. Most of you know what 100 corpses is, 500 or 1000 corpses have stood in these circumstances and remained worthy, apart from a few cases of human failure. It has toughened us up. It's a page of glory in our history that has never been written and never will be again. As early as 1941, Himmler ordered Us, let Auschwitz go on an industrial scale to receive more and more convoys. The red brick buildings of the old barracks are no longer enough. Three kilometers from this first site, then began the construction of Birkenau, a gigantic concentration camp. But also a killing center, where upon their arrival, the deportees are sent directly to the gas chambers. Us also uses prisoners to supply labor for an entire industrial complex. A large chemical plant is set up. At the cutting edge of technology at the time, in particular, it manufactures rubber for tires. The set at Auschwitz, that is, the camps, the city, the factories, it is a permanent and incessant construction site from 40 to almost 1945, the end of the war. Auschwitz continues to diversify. After this huge factory, Us develops a large agricultural project with Himmler. He shares that with Heinrich Himmler, who made, from 1918, agronomy studies. And so they have a common passion. Us oversee the installation of these greenhouses to research new plants. From 1943, the Birkenau camp became immense. The new agricultural center is established in a small hamlet, Rajsko. During the war, Auschwitz becomes a model city for the Nazis. The population is multiplied by four. Within the camp, alongside Rudolf, Us, another great Nazi criminal, also take advantage of the convoys arriving at Auschwitz. Son of rich industrialists, Dr. Joseph Mengele conducts medical experiments. Mengele conducts official research there, in an official setting. The concentration camp is run in a way, like at the butchers. In camp medical services and medical academies, the Nazi doctors carry out atrocious mutilations in particular on the bodies of Jewish and Gypsy deportees. Doctors who have been given full power over individuals, who are no longer relegated to the rank of human beings, but to the rank of human material, on which we will carry out all the research that we consider necessary to advance medicine in this or that department. The experiments of Dr. Mengele, they require children. In this column of little survivors, filmed here in 1945, in the front row, two little twin sisters hold hands. Hungarian jury, her name is Miriam and Eva, 11 years old at the time. We were little children, little girls, between the ages of 2 and 16, starved for food. We had no rights. We had a fierce determination to live one more day. When she landed on the quay of Auschwitz-Birkenau in 1944 with the five members of his family, Eva must, as soon as she gets off the train, to undergo the selection operated by the SS, who received the convoys and work for Mengele. Nazis running, yelling in German, twins, twins, and he noticed Miriam and me, we were dressed alike, we looked alike, and he demanded to know from my mother if we were twins, and my mother asked, 
Is that good? And the Nazi nodded yes. At that moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother in one direction. We were pulled in the opposite direction. We were crying, she was crying. Stripped of their belongings, four members of his family are sent to the gas chamber. If Eva and her sister survive, this is to be used by Dr. Mengel's experiments. Each day, they are taken to the medical service of the camp they run. Take a lot of blood from my left arm and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. The content of those injections we didn't know then, and unfortunately, I still do not know today. These injections make Eva seriously ill and causes a very high fever. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors. He never ever examined me. All he did, he looked at my fever chart. And then he declared laughing sarcastically. He said, too bad. She's so young. She has only two weeks to live. His Mengele experiments on twins, acts of torture, plays a strategic role for the Nazis. At the very heart of Nazi ideology, there's this idea that Aryan blood is rare, and everything must be done to promote reproduction, and allow the growth of the Aryan population. And so, we must try to find a method which allows the birth of twins, triplets. They were trying the older twins, who were in reproductive age, to mate female and male twins to see if the female got pregnant, if she would have twins because they were very interested in increasing the Aryan race. Eva and her sister survive, permanently affected by a serious physical deficiency. 1,100,000 people perish in Auschwitz. But from the end of 1941, Hitler and his accomplices experienced their first setbacks. Goering considers that waging war, at the same time in the West and East of Europe, is madness. But again, he is not confronting Hitler. Goering, at first, was very skeptical of an eastward offensive. And there, he realizes very quickly that, apparently, Hitler has made his decision. And that is the rule for Goering. If he has made a decision, it is up to him to obey orders. But Goering was right. against the USSR. The German army had not taken the measure of the freezing winter. The troops are running out. In front of Stalingrad, the losses are enormous. At that time, the young Dieter moved from the Hitler Youth to the Russian front, where he fights in the Hermann Goering division. The young soldier is only 17 years old. What I learned from the adults who were there, it is that Goering had a different opinion from Hitler. He didn't want war. And in a conversation with Hitler, Goering said, we don't want to play a game of chance. Hitler replied, I've always only played games of chance. Engaged in multiple battles, the Germans lack the necessary armament. But Hitler does not want to hear anything. He searches in his close guard, an accomplice capable of promising him a miracle. Goering, who once led the arms industry, apply as a candidate. Hitler, on the other hand, prefers a more motivated collaborator. He chooses his architect, Albert Speer. Hitler. Hitler said to him, you must become minister of armaments. Speer said he had no training in this area. Hitler insisted, saying, you will do it. So he accepted this mission. Without Speer, the war wouldn't have lasted that long. The Reich Minister for Armaments and War Production, visiting a large arms company, he replaced the workers for the investments in the incredible increase in production. Hitler asked him to double production rates. But from the start, for Speer, the problem seems complicated. The men are sent to the front, women have replaced them in the arms factories. 
Propaganda even encouraged them to quit their previous job. This worker was until recently a seamstress in a fashion salon. This one, saleswoman in a jewelry store. This one, a saleswoman in a perfumery. But it's still not enough to achieve the exorbitant goals dictated by Hitler. In addition, Speer is responsible for overseeing the development of secret weapons, who must reverse the course of the war. In particular, the V-1 and V-2 missiles, which have been tested for more than five years. The first ballistic missiles in history would be able to hit England. Against all odds, Speer pulled off the miracle. While the country suffered bombardments during the year 1943, like here in Hamburg, he manages to double the production of the armament. The guns and the tanks are assembled on the chain, in huge factories, where the workers work more than 70 hours per week. But his miracle also has a hidden side. Due to Allied bombings, town centers were destroyed and some industrial sites as well. That's when the idea came up to install production underground. In central Germany, in a region of forests 150 kilometers from Hanover, a sprawling project is going to be buried under this hill. The Nazis imagine a network of galleries of more than 12 kilometers, who cross from side to side all the mountain of Middle Badora. You enter through this vast entrance, 7 meters high. The old mine looks like an endless succession of tunnels. This maze has 45 bays. It is the largest underground factory in the world, where workers assemble the famous V-2 missiles. But it is also the heart of the system organized by Albert Speer. Thousands of deportees from concentration camps, they are locked up there night and day, to work like slaves. Of the 60,000 prisoners in the tunnel, 20,000 will die there, including more than 2,000 French. Albert Speer will always say to know nothing of these barbaric living conditions who make his miracle possible. Hitler considered him an organizational genius. He decorates it. Speer's ambition irritates his rivals. Speer succeeded in instrumentalizing the camp system for the arms industry. We know that apart from Hitler, Himmler particularly feared a rival. It was Speer, because he always managed to win over Hitler. Speer's miracle is not enough. The news coming from the Russian front are more and more catastrophic for the Germans. 200,000 soldiers are taken prisoner. Goering now physically bears the brunt of defeat. His drug use is skyrocketing. Puffy, glassy-eyed. He weighs more than 120 kilograms. He feels useless. It's a personal crisis. And this crisis, he tries to calm down by taking medicine, morphine or something. It is at this moment, that we make fun of him more and more. And it is also, not only the German public, but it is also Hitler who becomes more and more critical. Yet on the Eastern Front, when Marshal Goering inspects the Panzer Division, named after him, all soldiers must still pretend to believe in victory. Among the fighters of this unit is the young Dieter. We knew between us that the war was lost, but we could just think it, we couldn't say it openly. If someone said, the war is lost and all is over, he would have been shot. To curb this demotivation, Hitler needs a collaborator, capable of enlisting the Germans behind him. 
It's time for the most fanatical of his accomplices to come back into the light. Berlin Sports Palace, February 18, 1943, Goubales orchestrates a communication operation. He gathered a crowd of convinced Nazis, but also wounded returning from the front. He carefully chose his 14,000 spectators. The English claim that the German people oppose our government's total war measures. The people would not want total war according to the English, but surrender. I ask you, do you want total war? It creates a climate of hysteria in Germany. Do you want this war so total and so radical, than we can imagine? I ask you, are you determined to follow the Fuhrer to hell in order to achieve victory by accepting even the harshest personal trials? That evening, Goebbels, in a trance, will accomplish what he considers as the most successful performance of his career. Germany must sacrifice herself to the last. Germany will never capitulate. Goebbels is smart enough to realize that the situation is difficult, can be desperate. If victory is possible, it will be thanks to the energy, to the will and the sense of sacrifice. If defeat is inevitable, well the Nazis will disappear. With such a din, such a crash, such an apocalypse, that at least they will be immortalized by their sacrifice. His eternal rival, Goering, is finally disgraced. He comes back to the fore. Goubales then deploys an extraordinary energy. He visits the victims of the bombed cities. Listen to complaints, awards medals, and runs the soup kitchens. He will return fully to the fore, like a kind of vice Hitler, like a second Hitler, for the benefit of disaster. Goebbels also extends the age of mobilization for all Germans. Men are now enrolled until age 60. And the age of the youngest is lowered to only 16 years. As the Allies approach, I decided to commit. New recruits go to the front in their everyday clothes, with the weapons they have at hand. Goubales named the operation People's Storm. But in Berlin in ruins, where the inhabitants are reduced to eat, digging through the trash. One more piece of news will shake the morale of the Nazis. In Normandy, the Allies have just landed. Day by day, the collapse of the Reich is looming. Little Margit lives hidden in Berlin. To flee the Nazis, his father, a Jew, went into exile in China. And from his hiding place in July 1944, the little girl regains hope, hearing a news on the radio. My God! But on July 20th, 1944, it was the attack on Hitler. And you know what I heard first on the radio? It was Hitler's voice saying, Providence saved me. And she had saved him. In this completely devastated room of his headquarters, Hitler miraculously survived a bomb attack. Around him, there were four dead and nine seriously injured whom he visits in the hospital. The attack was organized by senior officers who wanted to negotiate with the Allies the surrender of Germany. 
This plot against Hitler triggers thousands of arrests, of torture and murder. Speer Himmler Goring Goebbels Know now all that they risk, if they betray him. But they will make very different choices. His accomplices are all supposed to follow their Führer, even in the sacrifice of their life. They are now trapped by Hitler, who has lost his lucidity. In March 1945, he was walking in slow motion. On these propaganda images, he sits facing a map and facing paralyzed generals, who dare not talk about defeat. He dominates them. He nails their beak, he scolds them, he yells at them. But in the spring of 1945, he moves small flags and pawns that no longer exist. On April 20, 1945, Hitler's 56th birthday, this is the last time they are filmed together. Goering and Himmler parade around, seemingly all smiles. But that's just an illusion. A few hours later, they hurriedly abandon Hitler. Goering learns that Hitler makes the decision not to leave Berlin. Goering leaves for southern Germany and flees. Because at that time, to stay in Berlin is to die. The Soviet soldiers crushed the city under the bombs. In a bunker under the monumental chancellery, of the three main accomplices, only Goebbels remains holed up with Hitler. If it leads to suicide, death, defeat, it does not matter. Because Dr. Goebbels, chief propagandist, will have worked on the staging of this death, so that forever and ever, the myth of this death, of this sacrifice, of its disappearance, will resound. As the empire crumbles, Joseph Goebbels, the fanatic, addressed to the Germans, April 21st, one last radio message. The moment of truth is approaching. I'm staying in Berlin with my entire cabinet. My wife and children too are here and will stay in Berlin. While the city is in the hands of the Soviets, on April 30, 1945, at 3 p.m., Hitler commits suicide. According to his last wishes, he designates Joseph Goebbels as his official successor. But Goebbels is only chancellor for a few hours. When the Soviets arrive in the Chancellery Gardens, they discover the charred bodies of Joseph and Magda Goebbels. With the corpses of their six children, that they poisoned before committing suicide. With Magda Goebbels, his wife, they agree that there is no future, there is no possible world without Nazism, so they murder their children. They turn off the next generation. It's Finnish. Everywhere in Germany, the Allies discover the same scene. Thousands of anonymous Nazis do not want to surrender and commit suicide as a family. Unlike Goebbels, Himmler and Goering, them, are ready to negotiate. Himmler and Goering remain politicians to the end, that is people who leave all options open, who calculate and who want to survive. Hermann Goering takes refuge in his residence on the border of Germany and Austria. Before his death, Hitler fired him. The Führer had designated him as his successor. So on April 23, 1945, Goering had sent him this classified telegram, where he had offered to replace him. If negotiations are necessary, I would be in a better position than you in Berlin. There he asks Hitler, if you are no longer able to make decisions, it is now up to me to take over your duties. Hitler considered this telegram a serious betrayal. And that is why Goering is dismissed from all his functions. Finally, in May 1945, Goering surrendered to the Americans. His wife and daughter are in safe custody. Goering
Goering is still convinced that he will be able to negotiate a surrender with honors. He is a marshal, the highest military rank, but he is told that he will be treated like a criminal. He understands from one minute to the next, that he has no chance of negotiating anything. Cause it's an unconditional surrender, that the Allies have been asking for for years. Hitler was also betrayed by his faithful, Heinrich Himmler. The leader of the SS is on the run. Since February 1945, to save his head, Himmler made secret contact with the Allies, to negotiate surrender. He even allowed his white Red Cross buses, to save more than 13,000 prisoners, whom he freed from the camps. Himmler played a double game at the end of the war, when he conducted negotiations behind Hitler's back with the Allies. We notice his disconnection from reality. He truly believed that the Allies were ready to accept it from a position of strength. When he realizes that he is not credible, Himmler hides among ordinary German soldiers taken prisoner. He wants to drown in the mass, disguised under a false identity. He was finally recognized near Hamburg, and when he is searched in this house by an English doctor, Himmler bites into a cyanide capsule, the poison he kept hidden in his mouth. He dies immediately. The killer of the century will never be accountable. He wanted to escape his responsibilities. Not just running away, but also by committing suicide, to not appear before a judge. On the same day, in Flensburg, in northern Germany, the last Nazi leaders are arrested. Among them are Hitler's protege Albert Speer, the architect and minister of armaments. In the summer of 1945, among the accomplices of Hitler's close guard, only Goering and Speer are still alive. Down the ladder, Oss also survived. They will answer for their crimes before the judges, they still think they'll make it out alive. In Nuremberg, on November 20, 1945, the trial of the century begins. These American, English, Russian and French magistrates must judge the 24 greatest Nazi criminals still alive. All face the death penalty. And for the first time in history, they will have to answer for a new crime, the crime against humanity. Accused number one is Hermann Goering, slimmed down, cured of his drug addiction, he feels particularly combative. He was in really good shape at the time, and he really took this trial as a fight. From the opening of the trial, Goering wanted to impose himself. According to American procedure, defendants just have to plead guilty or not guilty, but prepared a long tirade for him. Before responding to the court, whether I'm found guilty or not guilty. The president calls him to order. I inform you that the defendants are not authorized to make a declaration. You just have to plead guilty or not guilty. You must plead guilty or not guilty. On these charges, I plead not guilty. After him, all defendants will plead not guilty in turn. Not guilty. Not guilty. During the trial, Goering takes center stage. He still thinks of escaping the death penalty by his strategy. He wants to defend Hitler's project for Germany. His idea, it was almost at that time, to justify his Führer. But the judges have planned an electroshock. Nazi criminals must be confronted in full court, to the unbearable images filmed at the liberation of the camps. Images shot by Americans and Russians, to bear witness forever to the atrocities organized by the accused.
During the screening, Goering looks away. He understands that his defense is collapsing. Seeing the images on the screen, he had very little luck to succeed with his idea to explain and justify what happened for 12 years in Germany. The chilling testimony of Rudolf Buss, the commandant of the Auschwitz camp, will still overwhelm the accused. Certainly. The prisoners were treated harshly, but with a certain method. Until the end, they defend the Nazi regime. But in Nuremberg, only one will renounce his convictions and claim to know nothing about the Holocaust. It is however one of the closest to Hitler, Albert Speer, the architect. Hitler and the collapse of his regime. Prepare for a terrible time of suffering for the German people. After this trial, I will condemn Hitler as the person responsible for this misfortune. He claims that he always distanced himself from Hitler. He even considered assassinating her. Of course, it was grotesque. grotesque. On October 1, 1946, after 10 months of trial in Nuremberg, the verdict falls. Accused, Hermann, Wilhelm, Goering, the International Court condemns you, to word by hanging. Twelve defendants are sentenced to death by hanging. Speer's strategy paid off. He was only sentenced to 20 years in prison. Goering does not want to be hanged like a simple criminal, but die like a soldier, shot by firing squad. The court refuses him. So, ultimate provocation, a few hours before the execution of the sentence, with the complicity of one of his American guardians, Goering procures a poison capsule and commits suicide in his cell, still convinced to leave his mark in history. He explained that now I will be condemned, but in 50 years, you'll see, we are going to have small statuettes of Hermann Goering in all German apartments. Those in charge of Auschwitz, them, are delivered to the Polish justice. Because the atrocities happened on its soil. Among them, Rudolf Goose, the camp director. He is judged in Warsaw and condemned for the example to be hanged in the camp at the scene of his crimes. It's scary to see the coldness of these feelings. He doesn't really express regret about these assassinations. For him, he was just following orders. The years go by. In Hitler's close guard, only one remained alive and will become a master in the art of lying. When he comes out of Spandau prison, in the suburbs of Berlin, in 1966, Albert Speer is only 61 years old. Hitler's architect and minister, attracts media from around the world. After 20 years of detention, he is the only one who can tell from the inside, the functioning of power under Hitler. When Spau got out of prison, he had already signed a very lucrative contract to write his memoirs. For two years, Albert Speer has become a successful author. His memoirs, written in prison, are translated into 14 languages and have sold over a million copies. It's a star. Speer is interviewed on every television set around the world. Why did Hitler make you a friend of his? Hitler never had friends. And I said at the Nuremberg trial that if Hitler would have had friends, I was a friend of his. Maybe I fulfilled the dream of his youth. He continues to present himself as an architect, who hasn't heard of the regime's worst crimes. According to his claims, he knew nothing of the extermination of the Jews. But in the 70s, Speer is gradually overtaken by revelations on his involvement in the Holocaust. 
In particular, we know, thanks to this photo, which he visited in 1943, Mauthausen concentration camp, where more than 200,000 people died, and that he heard Himmler talk about the extermination of the Jews. If we knew everything we know today, he would have been sentenced to death at Nuremberg. He was a very dangerous personality. Under a bourgeois mask, he hid his true nature as an icy politician. Albert Speer will escape the truth until the end. Hitler's last relative dies in his bed from a heart attack in 1981. Joseph Mengele, the Auschwitz doctor, nicknamed the Angel of Death, died in 1979 in Brazil, without ever having been caught by justice. None of these great criminals, who worked so hard in Hitler's place, has no grave today. Their ashes were scattered, or their remains buried anonymously, to avoid any gathering of nostalgic people. Their traces are gradually disappearing. At the end of this path lost in the forest, without indication, these abandoned ruins are those of Adolf Hitler's favorite house, where all his accomplices met.